Good afternoon. We are back in council session for our first public hearing for the FY25 transportation fees, charges, and fares. A Transportation and Environment Committee work session is scheduled for April 25th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on April 18th, 2024. There are no speakers for this hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. We're going to move on to our next item, item number eight. This is a public hearing on a resolution to set FY25 property tax credit for the income tax offset. Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee FY25 operating budget work sessions are scheduled throughout April. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on April 25th, 2024. There are no speakers for this hearing, so that public hearing is now closed. We're going to move on to item number nine. This is a public hearing on the FY25 capital budget and FY25 to 30 capital improvements program projects, including alcohol beverage services, conveyor system upgrade, ABS delivery trucks purchase, county fleet electric vehicle charging stations, early care and education facility fund, fire station refurbishment, life science and technology centers, new organics processing facility, Seven Locks Road culvert replacement, and White Oak commercial area improvements and revitalization. CIP and operating budget committee work sessions are scheduled in April. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on April 25th, 2024. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak. You'll hear a tone when your time's up, and we appreciate everyone abiding by their allotted time. We have two speakers for this particular item. Uh, we have Letitia Gassaway paul and Bernard Scott. Come on up to the table. Welcome, Ms. Gassaway Paul. Just hit your button there, and whenever you're ready, you have three minutes. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the Count Montgomery County Council. My name is Letitia Gasly Paul, and I'm the great great granddaughter of William Dove. In 1880, he was among the first to settle in Potomac, Maryland. He bought 36 acres for $210 at a public auction and helped establish Scotland, a community of formerly enslaved African Americans. In 1924, the Scotland Amy Zion Church rose proudly, a testament to the perseverance and faith of the community that had once known the shackles of enslavement. Beyond being a place of worship, it served as a cornerstone of the community, hosting baptisms, weddings, and funerals. It has been a source of hope, nurturing thriving ministries, and supporting those in need. However, in 1962, the county filled in the land beside the church to expand and pave Seven Locks Road. This disrupted the natural flow of the rainwater, causing it to immaculate and impact our foundation and basement. The road was so that it intended to connect us, it ended up dividing us leaving our beloved church nestled in a bowl and vulnerable to our environmental changes, resulting in year after year after year of floods and leading to irreversible foundational damage. In 2019, a severe flood rendered our church marking the beginning of our fight against the past negligence. Members of the Scotland AME Zion Church have long endured the consequences of a mistake not of their own. Witnessing our sacred space suffer due to bureaucratic oversight. But today, we stand at the crossroads of accountability and action. I want to be clear about the facts. The church was originally built above the floodplain. Seven Locks Road was built where once the water once flowed freely and the existing culvert has never been adequate to handle the stream. If the county had consulted, consulted with the Scotland community and demonstrated concern for the land and its residents, 
the outcome may have been different. This is not up for debate. The insufficient culvert beneath Seven Locks Road intensified the flooding of the Scotland Emmy Zion Church in 2019 because it couldn't handle the heavy rainfall. In recent years, during the intense downpours, the two small op openings became overwhelmed, causing the water to back up. Replacing and enlarging the culvert is crucial for the church's long-term sustainability. And as we diligently work to rebuild for future generations, we hope that you keep this in mind. Please, please help us and keep the funding to maintain a bigger and wider culvert. Thank you for your powerful testimony. Our next speaker. Bernard Scott. My name is Bernard Scott. I am a 56-year member of the Scotland AME Zion Church, and I can attest to you that during the time when I first came to the church, we did not have a water problem. The water problem began with the moving of Seven Locks Road from one side of the church to the other. Uh, also, when the development the uh, above the church uh, began, uh, there was a shifting of the streams and there was an input of a storm drain maintenance system for that community and the outlet from that water was down on to the church. It, it uh, resulted in the church being in a bathtub. Mm -hmm. It resulted in a uh, flood management situation that we had nothing to do with. There was a culvert put on the north side of the church, and there was one put on the south side of the church. There was none run mm -hmm. through the property where the church stands. So the water was redirected across the new Seven Locks Road from one end of the church. The water was directed across Seven Locks Road on another side of the church, but where the church stands, there was no provision for the water to go anywhere. There was a small culvert on one side of the church that easily fills up with debris from what was left of the uh, stream that goes across, and when it rains, it cannot handle it. When it storms, it does not handle it. And when the rain is real bad, as it was in 2019, the entire parking lot, the entire basement, the entire area of the church is flooded. Now, my sister here explained the fact that the property gets flooded not by our fault. The property was flooded by those who allowed that culvert to be built on either end of the church, those who allowed the storm drain management system of the community above the church to allow the water to be outletted onto the church's property. And it was, it was caused by those who neglected the fact that when they put Seven Locks Road four feet higher than the church, that the water had to run off somewhere and they did not account for the area of the church's property that would allow the water to drain down into the little small culvert that was there. So we're simply asking that this be taken care of at the expense of those who, not accusatory, but I would really think that the engineers at that time knew exactly what was going to happen to the church. And we are currently in the process of building a brand new church. And we want the problem taken care of before the church is finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for your powerful and historic testimony to make sure that we have the full context of this item. Uh, we have no other speakers listed here and with appreciation this public hearing is now closed. I did want to acknowledge you have a, a moral support uh, uh, group uh, here so there's two people testifying on this but 
uh, quite a few others who are here in attendance to express their support uh, on uh, this particular item and to lift up your voices and the comments that you made. So thank you for that. We're going to move on to item number 10. This is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY 23 to 28 capital improvements program and supplemental appropriation 2465 to the FY 24 capital budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of General Services, Judicial Security Improvements, the amount of $500,000, the source of funds is GO bonds. Public Safety Committee work session is currently scheduled for April 24th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on April 17th, 2024. There are no speakers for this hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. We're going to move on to item number 11. This is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2472 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services, Shelter Services, Overflow and Security Expansion in the amount of $1.7,039,394. The source of funds is General Fund Undesignated Reserves. An amendment to the FY24 Operating Budget Resolution 2184, Section G, designation of entities for non-competitive contract award status, Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless, and Interfaith Works, Inc. The Health and Human Services Committee held a work session on April 15, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business today, April 16, 2024. We have two registered speakers uh, today for this item, each speaker has three minutes to speak. You'll hear a tone when your time is up. We appreciate you abiding by the time. And with that, when you are ready, uh, Ms. Kruger, you have three minutes. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Liz Kruger, Director of Homeless Services. Good to see everybody again. It is no surprise that I am here today to support the supplemental appropriation for the IW and MCCH shelters, particular, uh, with particular, particular emphasis on the overflow and security expansion. So at IW and MCCH, we have already been doing the extra work, which we were asked to do by our CEF partners, as well as community members. We were meeting a community need. We have increased capacity at all our shelters. And uh, at IW in particular, that's a combination of 62 beds, which is year round and overflow. So this is across the Low Barrier Shelters of Progress Place, New Leaf, and the two women's center shelters. So we have also, uh, because of the increased population of persons experiencing homelessness, we are seeing massive numbers coming through all our shelters, but also through our drop-in center at Progress Place, where we have this year already doubled our numbers from last year. So it's over 1,200 unduplicated persons that are coming for basic needs, which includes case management and diversion. And we are meeting those needs as well. We have been meeting with individuals, families. Just two weeks ago, we helped divert a single mother with three children back to uh, a family member's house until she could secure housing with another family in Riverdale. This is outside of the scope of what we no normally do. And I want to be clear, we will do it no matter what but we are running out of contract funds for this year. And so we are here to ask for that support and to thank the HHS committee for um, supporting this thus far, as well as the county executive. And I, I know my colleague Susie will uh, go into greater detail about the things that we've been doing, but I do wanna take my final minute to state our position that at Interfaith Works, we don't want to keep asking for more money for shelters. Um, it's not humane. I've been working in shelters for 19 years now, and it's not intended to be a long-term solution, and we've come to depend upon it in this country and in this community as well. We are in the midst of fielding you know, a lot of um, problems from the lifting of moratorium and of running out of pandemic funding. And so we knew this was coming and we are prepared, but we need to start having that conversation about how are we are going to shift resources away from shelters into prevention, into rental back into the rental assistance program, into affordable housing. And we wanna be a part of that conversation. So I wanna make that clear in closing that we don't want to keep having this conversation. But thank you for your su the support in the meantime. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Sinclair Smith. You have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you, Liz. I'm so glad you went ahead of me. So um, we are sister agencies and work hand in hand. And I'm really going to focus on the need for security at our emergency shelter. I couldn't agree more with Liz's statements. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to, to come and talk to you today, especially with our sister agency. And we believe that everyone in Montgomery County deserves a safe, stable, and affordable place to call home. But for many, emergency shelter is that first step, to quickly connect to housing and get the resources you need. And to help people move on to stable lives. We serve approximately 1,700 men, women, and children in our emergency shelter, men's shelter program, our VA safe havens emergency program. We have um, about 14 permanent housing programs, both permanent supportive and um, rapid rehousing. So this is really focusing on our work at the sh shelter. And um, we've operated the men's shelter for over 30 years now. And we have, like Interfaith Work, developed a robust array of services at on site at our shelter. Um, including behavioral health, um, employment, housing supports, the whole um, primary behavioral health care. Um, we are very proud that we were recently um, approved as the first emergency shelter in Maryland as an overdose response program in Maryland. Um, we are, uh, it allows us to provide education, hand out naloxone, go through prescriptions. I want to, we talked earlier about peers. It was the work of our harm reduction and our peer supports who really got that program off the ground. We have seen a almost 30% decrease in overdoses and we have not seen any deaths lately. So it's the work of our shelter staff is really critical. We began partnering with Cooper T. Cooper, a security firm, um, over 10 years ago at our old shelter. They have hung in there with us um, from there to through COVID and now to our new men's emergency shelter. They really, and I think you, you work with them as well, they specialize in um, harm reduction and de-escalation. Um, they provided services throughout COVID, but also um, when we came to Neville Street, uh, they helped us design the facility as well as the um, operations. And they, they had a number of observations, because I think I've talked to a number of people who say, oh, this is so expensive. But what they have seen is that um, our space is much larger now. We have up to 274 men there at one time. We have less open observable spaces. There's an increase in drug overdoses. Um, it's also noticed in a low barrier environment, frail elderly and youth and other vulnerable um, clients are, 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 are vulnerable, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and the history of past acts of violence that some of our men have make it a, a, a we, we feel it's responsible for us to ensure the health and safety of our clients. And um, we strongly support the supplemental appropriation. Um, we also encourage you to include it in the base budget. Um, what, what this, uh, working with the security company, and I'll just be real quick, um, has helped us um, really divert our attention to new innovative programming and helping our men get out of shelters quickly as possible. We are in a new operating environment due to COVID, and we do look forward to working with you as we, we both, with our years of experience. Thank you very much. Promote solutions. Appreciate it. Thank you both and to your organizations for your work to support our most vulnerable residents. We really appreciate it. With that, this public hearing is now closed. Our next item is item number 12. This is a public hearing on supplemental appropriation 2473 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services, MoCo Pride Center, Inc. In the amount of $200,000, the source of funds is general fund undesignated reserves. And an amendment to the FY24 operating budget resolution 2184, section G, FY24, designation of entities for non-competitive contract award status, MoCo Pride Center, Inc., in the same amount of $200,000. A Joint Health and Human Services and Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled currently for April 29th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on April 22nd, 2024. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak. You'll hear a tone when your time is up. We appreciate you abiding by the allotted time. Call up Lee Blinder, Philip Alexander Downey, Makeda Richardson, Marshall Friedman. I'm going to join us at the table. We'll go in the order that I called the names, Lee, when you are ready. Hit your button. 
and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, esteemed council and our guests. My name is Lee Blinder, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm an openly transgender, non-binary, and queer person. I'm extremely proud to share that I grew up in Montgomery County, I'm a graduate of MCPS, somehow that was 24 years ago, and I'm an alumni of Montgomery College. I'm here today in my capacity as the executive director and founder of Trans Maryland. We are a multiracial, multigender community power building organization for Maryland's trans community. Uh, Trans, Mar Trans Maryland was birthed six years ago in Montgomery County due to my own lack of access to gender affirming care and resources. Um, I, in addition, I co-founded Queer MoCo. I'm a founding member of the county's LGBTQ advisory uh, board. I'm a co-founder of Trans Maryland's uh, Maryland Trans Resilience Conference, uh, which was held at the Silver Spring Civic Center in 2022. I was a lead consultant on the county's 2023 LGBTQ plus survey report, which you all have. I'm a lead author of the Maryland Trans Survey, which I'm thrilled to announce has just launched our initial findings report. I can share with you all, it's on our website and I'm now the chair of the Maryland Commission on LGBTQI plus affairs. These positions that I hold are almost all exclusively uncompensated or offer a minimal stipend for the work. This is alarming as my community is facing an unprecedented level of threats to our existence, our healthcare, our safety, our well-being, and our sanity. In addition to the current needs, it, we in Montgomery County are also facing a sharp influx of new residents and their families who are seeking safe harbor uh, from anti-trans legislation and policies across the United States. It is really heartbreaking to speak today about the myriad of threats that transgender people are facing in our society. I prefer to uplift my community when speaking about transgender people and talk about the joy that living as one's full self can impart. Um, however, I'm here today to illuminate the need uh, that being myself um, has brought, or sorry, to illuminate the need and to implore you uh, to ensure that this life-saving work is written into um, the budget beyond just the supplemental so that our vital work can continue. I've often been the first call that people make in Montgomery County when a young person who is transgender or queer is kicked out of their house for, from an unaffirming situation. Um, I'm not paid by the county to be a 24-7 uh, youth crisis housing responder. Um, however, it is part of my uncompensated duties um, because I am very uh, dedicated to our young trans and queer people. Um, Montgomery County and Trans Maryland, uh, as a part of the MoCo Pride uh, family, um, are ready to provide the many resources um, that we possess and our unique skill set um, to excel. So please consider this uh, proposal and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker, Philip Alexander Downey. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, esteemed council members. Thank you for having me. My name is Philip Alexander Downey, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm a queer, lifelongish resident of Montgomery County and the CEO of the MoCo Pride Center, Montgomery County Pride family. Um, we are the consortium of LGBTQIA plus service, advocacy, and arts and culture organizations and programs in Montgomery County, which include Living Your Truth, Trans Maryland, MoCo Pride Prom, Montgomery County Pride in the Plaza, Drag Story Hour, DMV, Maryland Trans Unity, and the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities. When I was here last week, I spoke about the need to fund programs that reach our most underserved, marginalized, and disenfranchised communities. And today I'm here in support of this supplemental appropriation. Today I wanted to focus specifically on the great work we do and how our services are a public good, but at our board meeting last night, I was once again struck with undeniable facts that this is a real and present emergency. Threats of violence persist and are extreme towards programs like Drag Story Hour, a family-friendly, culturally competent, multilingual literacy program is marred with frequent bomb threats, so much so that the FBI is now involved. When bomb-sniffing dogs must come to programs and they're cleared out, its audience is further subjected to angry mobs of hate groups screaming obscenities and homophobic slurs at children and families. This is a perfect example in a sea of reasons why dedicated programming in an LGBTQ resource center is needed. Some venues discontinue their relationship with our programs after they re receive threats. The only 
owners of loyalty bookstores in Silver Spring received death threats and bomb threats to their business as well as their personal residence. Our relationship continues, but no person or entity should have to be resilient in the face of death threats and violence. This funding will be the first step to ensure that we can continue to safely serve our vast communities with complex needs. This would be the first round of funding we received from the Montgomery County government. Prior to this year, I donated my salary to ensure the continuation of these vital programs. But that model is not equitable nor sustainable. We're calling on you as the county council to provide the supplemental funding in addition to sustainable future funding to ensure access to a totality of crucial wellness resources as we bridge the gap to basic necessities. For these reasons and more, 50-plus faith community leaders are urging you to support this request in full via a letter you have received or will receive from Pastor Willard Green. Additionally, I'm here to speak for those with voices uh, whose voices can no longer be heard, like my fraternity brother, a black trans man and Silver Spring native whose death is a glaring reminder that this is indeed a life-or-death situation for some of our most vulnerable community members. I look forward to the work we do together to mitigate these created problems and ensure our most vulnerable communities have culturally competent vital wellness programs and affirming safe spaces. Thank you so much. Thank you. I did want to confirm that we have received the correspondence from Pastor Will Ed Green. We wish him well. Uh, he was uh, registered to speak today but wasn't able to do so, but that is included in the record. So colleagues do have that. Just wanted to confirm that. Our next speaker, uh, Makeda Richardson. Esteemed members of the City Council, thank you for opening up this space uh, for me to join you all today. My name is Makita Richardson, she, her. I am a 17-year resident of Montgomery County, Maryland, and a two-spirited bisexual black and Native American woman. I stand before you today as not only a small business owner in Montgomery County, a DEIB practitioner and mother, but a steadfast advocate for equity, equality, and inclusivity with an urgent plea on behalf of our LGBTQ plus community in our county. Our community is facing unprecedented challenges that demand our immediate action. In our diverse community, the importance of creating inclusive spaces for black and LGBTQ plus individuals cannot be overstated. As hate groups surge and legislative threats loom large, our community finds itself in a climate of hostility unlike any we've ever seen before. The need for support and protection has never been more critical. As a business owner, I have seen firsthand the positive impact of fostering an environment where everyone feels seen, welcomed, valued, and heard. When we embrace diversity and celebrate our differences and provide access to much needed resources to much needed communities, we create stronger and more vibrant communities where all individuals can thrive. As a DEI practitioner, I recognize that creating inclusive spaces is not enough. We must also actively advocate for the rights and well-being of marginalized communities, including the LGBTQ plus community. Queer advocacy is not just a matter of principle. It is a fundamental duty that we owe all members of our society. As a mother, I understand, acknowledge, and appreciate that our current progress is the result of a sacrifices made by individuals from diverse backgrounds, striving to build a fair world for all of us. I embrace the responsibility to carry forward this work for future generations, advocating not only for my children and grandchildren, but also for all marginalized and neglected communities. The support programs and services that, comp that comprise the Montgomery County Pride family, Montgomery County Pride Center, Inc., have long served as a beacon of hope and resilience for the LGBTQ plus individuals across the county. And the challenges we now face threatens to undermine the very foundation of the vital services we provide. Today, I am proud to be, with he be here with you on the land of the Piscataway people, employing you to approve supplemental appropriation to support the Montgomery County Pride family, Montgomery County Pride Center Incorporated, in its efforts to serve our most vulnerable communities. With this funding, we can continue our efforts to provide much needed and accessible services while we strategically plan for a just and sustainable future for all LGBTQ plus individuals. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Our next speaker, Marshall Friedman. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Marshall Friedman. I'm a ninth grade student at Pulsville High School, 
and I'm here today in support of, of supplemental appropriation. I wanted to talk to you today about why the Montgomery County Council must provide sustainable funding to organizations dedicated to fighting for the rights of some of our community's most marginalized individuals. Specifically, I asked the council to recognize the critical role the MoCo, uh, the MoCo Center and Pride family play in supporting queer people in this county. In my own life, from the day I came out and even today, I face discrimination inside and outside of our public schools. Sco uh, students are taught to accept and ignore normalized biases against queer people. I felt scared and isolated myself. As I've started my journey into advocacy, especially for the continuation of, L of LGBTQ representation in, in MCPS, it is easy for this battle to feel like an uphill one against even people I know. This is why I cannot understate how the MoCo Pride Resource Center is so important for student advocates like myself who are dedicated uh, to ensuring it's a, a support system for LGBTQ people of all ages. That support, as well as the resources that our Pride Center is committed to providing, is essential in nurturing cultural competency for LGBTQ, LGBTQ people, as well as our queer youth. For, uh, for queer and trans individuals, students especially, we face discrimination both in and out of the classroom, just for wanting to be comfortable in our own skin. The lawsuit against MCPS a few months ago over books of queer characters in schools is just one example of the continued homophobia normalized, justified, and disguised in our community. For the students and individuals who yet, in spite of this, continue the call for the support LGBTQ individuals, individuals deserve and need, we must meet their needs through the simple yet transformative tool the MoCo Pride Center provides. With opportunities for people of all ages and backgrounds to advocate for themselves, the Pride Center creates accessibility for challenges that go widely undiscussed. Moreover, their dedication to intersectionality and uplifting all Montgomery County residents highlights their broader impact beyond building inclusive spaces. Places dedicated to the safety of queer people uplift, especially for trans teenagers who face an inc increased risk of homelessness, housing inequality, and food insecurity. We are in a tumultuous election year with a former president who wants to put an end to gender affirming care for minors and who withdrew all federal protections for trans students in 2017, I cannot overstate how this is the time now more than ever to provide sustainable funding to the MoCo Pride Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That is all for this panel. Thank you for your testimony. I'm going to call up Ezra Town, Douglas Hill, Reverend Dr. Jill McCrory, Oju Ajagbi. As we don't want to, we don't want the monitor to block you. As soon as you're ready, you have three minutes. President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and esteemed members of the Montgomery County Council, my name is Ezra Town, and my pronouns are they, them. I'm honored to be here testifying again on county funding for the MoCo Pride Center. I'm here today also as the president of Maryland TransUnity, an organization that provides peer facilitated support groups and community building opportunities for Montgomery County's trans and non-binary adults. I'm also a co-founder of MoCo Pride Center, which is asking for basic supplemental funding to continue programs, but we also need full, generous, healthy funding and budget support for the entire Montgomery County Pride family. This additional funding from the county would help ensure appropriate staff, resources, and ultimately an adequate space to carry out programming, as well as provide a safe, welcoming gathering area for Montgomery County's LGBTQIA communities. MoCo Pride Center's priority for the months and years ahead is centering the voices and needs of the most marginalized queer and trans people. It was one of the reasons I co-founded the center, and I'm pleased that it is still a big part of its mission. You've just received some national and local statistics that describe the population of trans folks and the greater LGBTQIA community that the MoCo Pride Center wants to serve. You may be familiar with some of them. It is statistics like these, which end up over-representing white people and under-representing seniors that demonstrate just how much work our county has to do to connect with the black and brown queers and seniors that we know exist. Montgomery County's 2023 LGBTQ plus community survey also shows us 
that our county's queer and trans communities do not feel welcome in communities of faith or houses of worship. The statistics also show that we have a lot to do to protect trans and non-binary individuals in healthcare and police interactions. The community building that would occur through programming and a central space would help the trans and non-binary communities organize to improve these conditions. A centralized space that's not affiliated with a faith community that's metro accessible, ADA compliant, and has all gender restrooms is absolutely essential in connecting these communities across Montgomery County. Um, ultimately, Maryland TransUnity would benefit from an actual center with a physical space in a few ways, a free place to hold our support group meetings <clears throat> and social activities, a permanent address, which is not in a volunteer's home, <clears throat> and the ability to feel loved by and interact with cisgender members of our queer communities. The county as a whole would also benefit from a centralized place to locate queer and trans stakeholders, and local press would be able to find um, voices to represent the LGBTQIA community in Montgomery County. It's for these reasons that I ask for strong funding in the FY 2025 supplemental and overall budget for MoCo Pride Center so that currently disparate organizations for the trans and queer communities in Montgomery County, like Maryland TransUnity, have a centralized base for program building, including a physical space when appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Douglas Hill. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today, Council. Uh, my name is Doug Hill, a MoCo resident for over 40 years, and I want to thank the council so much for considering that MoCo Pride family is supported for 2024 and is in the budget for 2025. The services provided by the organizations involved are essential to the MoCo community. As the father of two MCPS alums, I saw the importance of being an affirming voice in my children's lives. Some of their friends' parents weren't able to be affirming to their children for a variety of reasons. I know the barriers can be numerous for families when it comes to understanding and affirming your LGBTQIA plus child, but what really helped me was my eldest child came out as queer and later as transgender and was to ground my, able to ground myself in the values I was raised in. Those values of respect for differences, for a society that is strengthened by difference, and for ensuring that families can be kept together guided me and my LGBTQ family has been affirming. For those who aren't there yet, the risks are great, both to the child and to the parents, and it can result in children becoming homeless and parents losing the relationship with their child and even in losing their child to suicide. I take that seriously, and we have housed some of my children's friends when their parents abandoned them. The council funding the Monco Pride Center as a safe haven for LGBTQIA youth is a giant step forward. When I was considered testified today, I thought about reading headlines from newspapers to reinforce the state of the current attacks on the community, but then I realized I would be reintroducing that atmosphere here. It did not want to bring the opportunity for trauma, and I see that the staff report has that you have that information. Not many dads feel comfortable or have the language for this discussion, but I implore the council and my female dads to get involved. The life you save could be your own child's. Please pass the supplemental appropriation for the fiscal year uh, 24 budget and support for 2025. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Reverend Dr. Jill McCrory. Just make sure you hit your button. <laughs> we can hear you, but we want to make sure everybody after watching doing this and tuning for so in many here. years, I would remember to push the button. My name is Reverend Jill McCrory. Many of you know me. I have been before you for many years. Uh, and today I'm testifying uh, as a pastor, as an ally. But most of you know I'm also another co-founder of the center. Um, but what you might not know is that the center was my doctoral project. And because of that, we had to conduct quite a lot of research. Back in 2017, when we did this research, we identified critical needs within the LGBTQ plus community that were not being addressed in our county. My dissertation states that our desire was to grow a dynamic center that would bring resources together to provide for those needs. According to CenterLink, which represents over 200 LGBTQ plus centers across the country, 
Centers are primary change agents in the national movement working toward the liberation and empowerment of queer people. Through the services and activities of these community centers, over two million people are impacted annually. In the seven years since its creation, the MoCo Pride Center has impacted the queer community in our county in a variety of ways. Center programs, partner programs, and the support of programs within what we call the Pride family have provided a great number of resources in the areas of social events, health screening, legislative efforts, speaking engagements, workshops, the Pride Prom, and of course, Pride in the Plaza. I'm reminded that seven years ago, Jamie Raskin went to the Frederick Pride Festival and said, why can't we have one of those in our county? I'm proud that that is part of what has been uh, brought to fruition. However, these programs and projects could do so much more with additional funding. I know as an active pastor and ally that there's still so much need. And in many ways, this support is needed more now than in 2017. As a pastor and as an ally, I do not have the same things happening to me as our queer community. However, I will tell you that I've been personally accosted in my own church because we have a rainbow flag and signs that say that everyone's welcome. And so this hate goes far. It goes far and wide. So I'm asking you today to help make the vision of the whole Pride family a more solid reality in 2024. You can make an incredible impact through this funding and you can help the Pride family increase the care for our LGBTQA plus community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Oju Ajagbe. And I'm a newcomer, so let's see how I do. <laughs> so I'm just gonna read right what I have. Good afternoon, distinguished council members. My name is Oju Ajagbe, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak in favor of Supplemental Appropriation 2473 to the fiscal year 24 operating budget for Montgomery County, Maryland. Thank you also to my fellow testifiers here today. As a lifelong resident of Montgomery County, I appreciate the continued and growing diversity of the constituents, constituents within our borders. With increased diversity comes the need to give but comes the need and importance for the creation of safe spaces to give all voices the opportunity to be, to be heard, feel seen, plus included. In addition to being an active member of the community, personally serving as a notary public, U.S. Census 2020 enumerator, and Board of Elections election judge, I have had the wonderful opportunity to volunteer, participate, as well as attend numerous events hosted by Mr. Philip Alexander Downing, Living Your Truth, known as LIT, and the MoCo Pride Center. As an inaugural and recurring cast member of the original TV show, Black Girl Magic Stories, I am thankful for how Mr. Downey works tirelessly to ensure important plus inclusive conversations affecting minority, marginalized, and disenfranchised populations, especially addressing the need for total health and wellness, have a visible platform. Black Girl Magic Stories was created by Mr. Downey to, quote, spotlight the stories, intergenerational perspectives, wisdom, hurdles, and triumphs that come with being a woman from across the African diaspora living in the U.S. who reside in Montgomery County. The importance of, of approving Supplemental Appropriation 2473 to the fiscal year 24 operating budget ensures that Black on Magic Stories, as well as the supporting events, in addition to the inclusive initiatives shared by my fellow testifiers here today, can continue to flourish due to having the funding to serve all minority, marginalized, and disenfranchised populations especially addressing the important need for total health and wellness. As I have learned through my personal development work, quote, true unity is diversity and harmony. Funding this appropriation is one step in working toward increasing the harmony within the, diverse, within the diversity of Montgomery County, Maryland. Thank you, distinguished council members, for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you to everybody for joining and sharing your perspective and your lived experience. That is all for this panel. We have one final speaker. Uh, who has joined us uh, on video, Greer Hamilton. Hello. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for this opportunity to join and testify. My name is Greer Hamilton, and I use they and them pronouns. I'm here as a trans and non-binary proud resident of Montgomery County, and also as a member of several organizations in the county that provide resources and services to the queer and trans community. I would have been there today. I've fallen ill, and I'm sipping my tea and honey as fast as I can. Um, 
Uh, I urge the Council to move forward with a supplemental funding request. This funding is crucial as a small part of the growth of the MoCo Pride Center so that the Center can provide urgently needed services to the LGBTQ community. Um, I came out as transgender and navigated transition, not in Montgomery County. I'm not a lifelong resident. I'm grateful to be here. The MoCo Pride Family Center of all of the various groups have welcomed me wholeheartedly. But I came out in a place that had a dedicated health center with comprehensive, culturally competent health care specifically for the LGBTQ community. Not only was there a dedicated health center for my community, there was also an organization that provided additional needed services to the LGBT community at little to no cost. These services included things like therapy, navigating housing, offering legal resources, hosting support groups, amongst many, many other services. And I want to be sure to hold up the, the, the incredible amount of work that has gone on here, uh, particularly I know of the support groups, of uh, the many things that uh, the other lifelong residents have worked on for so, so very long and so hard. The queer and trans community of Montgomery County desperately need and deserve the same level of care that I was able to receive uh, when I came out a, few year, a number of years ago. In this day and age, when so much hatred and vitriol are directed specifically at me and my community, I wonder what it would be like to come out today here in Montgomery County as queer or trans. What would it be like to navigate social transition, to try to find health care that understands my needs as a trans person desperately in search of culturally competent care? Even today, as, as, a, as uh, a resident of Montgomery County, I travel to, uh, to, to PG County to receive the health care that I need. I fear for our queer and trans children, for our queer, my queer and trans peers, and for our queer and trans elders. And while I know this fear will persist, I also have the deepest gratitude, respect, appreciation, and love for our queer trans children, my peers, and for our elders. Our resilience and determination deserve so much more than what Montgomery County has to offer right now. For Montgomery County to live up to our values, for Montgomery County to care for our LGBTQ children, teenagers, adults, and elders, the council must approve the supplemental funding request for the Moco Pride Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That is all the speakers that we have today. I see that uh, Councilmember Glass would like to make a comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I just want to say that I only wish there was an organization like MoCo Pride Center when I was growing up. Uh, and I know I speak for thousands of people throughout Montgomery County, but I just want to say thank you to everybody who testified today. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for bringing your true and authentic selves into the council chamber today. Thank you. This public hearing is now closed. We're going to move on to item number 13. This is a public hearing on supplemental appropriation 2470, the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Public Schools employee benefits plan in the amount of $5 million. The source of funds is current fund. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this hearing. So this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve supplemental appropriation 2470 moved by Second. the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, seconded by uh, Council Member Sales. All those in favor of this appropriation 2470? That is unanimous among all those present. Uh, so it is approved 10 to nothing. 11 to nothing, if that counts, we'll count it. I'll, I'll leave it to the clerk uh, on, on that one, but it's unanimous. Uh, unanimous approval uh, for that. Uh, that is all of the items that we have today, colleagues, and with that, uh, we are now adjourned. I will note that there was a joint committee session scheduled originally for 3 o'clock, and that committee session has been canceled. So uh, that is all the official business before the council today. Thank you, and we are adjourned.